The Surprising Adventures of Baron Munchausen by Rudolf Eric Rasp, published in 1895. Preface to the First Edition Baron Munichausen, or Munchausen, of Bodenwader near Hamlin on the Weser, belongs to the noble family of that name, which gave the king's German dominions the late prime minister and several other public characters equally bright and illustrious. He is a man of great original humor, and having found that prejudiced minds cannot be reasoned into common sense, and that bold asserters are very apt to bully and speak their audience out of it, he never argues with either of them, but adroitly turns the conversation upon indifferent topics and then tells the story of his travels, campaigns, and sporting adventures, in a manner peculiar to himself and well calculated to awaken and shame the common sense of those who have lost sight of it by prejudice or habit. As this method has often attended with good success, we beg leave to lay some of his stories before the public, and humbly request those who shall find them rather extravagant and bordering upon the marvelous, which will require but a very moderate share of common sense, to exercise the same upon every occurrence of life, and chiefly upon our English politics, in which old habits and bold assertions, set off by eloquent speeches and supported by constitutional mobs, associations, volunteers, and foreign influence, have of late, we apprehend, but too successfully turned our brains, and made us the laughing stock of Europe, and of France, and Holland in particular. Chapter 1 The Baron relates an account of his first travels, the astonishing effects of a storm, arrives at Ceylon, combats and conquers two extraordinary opponents, returns to Holland. Some years before my beard announced approaching manhood, or in other words, when I was neither man nor boy, but between both, I expressed in repeated conversations a strong desire of seeing the world, from which I was discouraged by my parents, though my father had been no inconsiderable traveler himself, as will appear before I reach the end of my singular and, I may add, interesting adventures. A cousin by my mother's side took a liking to me, often said I was fine, forward youth, and was much inclined to gratify my curiosity. His eloquence had more effect than mine, for my father consented to my accompanying him in a voyage to the island of Ceylon, where his uncle has resided as governor for many years. We sailed from Amsterdam with dispatches from their high mightinesses, the States of Holland. The only circumstance which happened on our voyage worth relating was the wonderful effects of a storm, which had torn up by the roots a great number of trees of enormous bulk and height, in an island where we lay anchor to take in wood and water. Some of these trees weighed many tons yet they were carried by the wind so amazingly high that they appeared like feathers of small birds floating in the air, for they were at least five miles above the earth. However, as soon as the storm subsided, they all fell perpendicularly into their respective places, and took root again, except the largest, which happened when it was blown into the air, to have a man and his wife, a very honest old couple, upon his branches, gathering cucumbers. In this part of the globe that useful vegetable grows upon trees. The weight of this couple, as the tree descended, overbalanced the trunk, and brought it down in a horizontal position. It fell upon the chief man of the island and killed him on the spot. He had quitted his house in the storm, under an apprehension of it falling upon him, and was returning through his own garden when this fortunate accident happened. The word fortunate here requires some explanation. This man was the chief of a very avaricious and oppressive disposition, and though he had no family, the natives of the island were half starved by his oppressive and infamous impositions. The very goods which he had thus taken from them were spoiling in his stores, while the poor wretches from whom they were plundered were pining in poverty. Though the destruction of this tyrant was accidental, the people chose the cucumber gatherers for their governors, as a mark of their gratitude for destroying, though accidentally, their late tyrant. After we had repaired the damages we sustained in this remarkable storm, and taken leave of the new governor and his lady, we sailed with a fair wind for the object of our voyage. In about six weeks we arrived at Ceylon, where we received with great marks of friendship and true politeness. The following singular adventures may not prove unentertaining. After we had resided at Ceylon about a fortnight, I accompanied one of the governor's brothers upon a shooting party. He was a strong, athletic man, and being used to that climate, for he had resided there for some years, he bore the violent heat of the sun much better than I could. In our excursion he had made a considerable progress through a thick wood when I was only at the entrance. Near the banks of a large piece of water, which had engaged my attention, I thought I heard a rustling noise behind. On turning about, I was almost petrified, as who would not be, at the sight of a lion, which was evidently approaching with the intention of satisfying his appetite with my poor carcass, and that without asking my consent. What was to be done in this horrible dilemma? I had not even a moment for reflection. My piece was only charged with swan shot, and I had no other about me. 
However, though I could have no idea of killing such an animal with that weak kind of ammunition, yet I had some hopes of frightening him by the report, and perhaps of wounding him also. I immediately let fly, without waiting until he was within reach, and the report did but enrage him, for now he quickened his pace, and seemed to approach me full speed. I attempted to escape, but that only added, if an addition could be made, to my distress, for the moment I turned about I found a large crocodile, with his mouth extended almost ready to receive me. On my right hand was the piece of water before mentioned, and on my left a deep precipice, said to have, as I have since learned, a receptacle at the bottom for venomous creatures. In short, I gave myself up as lost, for the lion was now upon his hind legs, just in the act of seizing me. I fell involuntarily to the ground with fear, and, as it afterwards appears, he sprang over me. I lay some time in a situation which no language can describe, expecting to feel his teeth or talons in some part of me every moment. After waiting in this prostrate situation a few seconds, I heard a violent but unusual noise, different from any sound that had ever before assailed my ears. Nor is it at all to be wondered at when I inform you from whence it proceeded. After listening for some time, I ventured to raise my head and look round when, to my unspeakable joy, I perceived the lion had, by the eagerness with which he sprung at me, jumped forward, as I fell into the crocodile's mouth, which, as before observed, was wide open. The head of the one stuck in the throat of the other and they were struggling to extricate themselves. I fortunately recollected my couteau de chasse, which was by my side. With this instrument I severed the lion's head at one blow, and the body fell at my feet. I then, with the butt end of my fowling piece, rammed the head further into the throat of the crocodile, and destroyed him by suffocation, for he could neither gorge nor eject it. Soon after I had thus gained a complete victory over my two powerful adversaries, my companion arrived in search of me, for finding I did not follow him into the wood, he returned, apprehending I had lost my way or met with some accident. After mutual congratulations, we measured the crocodile, which was just forty feet in length. As soon as we had related this extraordinary adventure to the governor, he sent a wagon and servants, who brought home the two carcasses. The lion's skin was properly preserved, with its hair on, after which it was made into tobacco pouches, and presented by me, upon our return to Holland, to the burgomasters, who in return requested my acceptance of a thousand ducats. The skin of the crocodile was stuffed in the usual manner, and makes a capital article in their public museum at Amsterdam, where the exhibitor relates the whole story to each spectator, with such additions as he thinks proper. Some of his variations are rather extravagant. One of them is that the lion jumped quite through the crocodile, and was making his escape at the back door, when, as his head appeared, Monsieur the Great Baron, as he is pleased to call me, cut it off, and three feet of the crocodile's tail along with it. Nay, so little attention has this fellow to the truth that he sometimes adds, as soon as a crocodile missed his tail, he turned about, snatched the couteau de chasse out of Monsieur's hand, and swallowed it with such eagerness that it pierced his heart and killed him immediately. The little regard with which this impudent knave has to veracity makes me sometimes apprehensive that my real facts may fall under suspicion, being found in company with his confounded inventions. Chapter 2 In which the Baron proves himself a good shot. He loses his horse, and finds a wolf, makes him draw his sledge, promises to entertain his company with a relation of such facts as are well deserving their notice. I set off from Rome on a journey to Russia in the midst of winter from just a notion that frost and snow must of course mend the roads, which every traveler had described as uncommonly bad through the northern parts of Germany, Poland, Courland, and Livonia. I went on horseback as the most convenient manner of traveling, but I was lightly clothed, and of this I felt the inconvenience more I could advance northeast. What must not a poor old man have suffered in that severe weather and climate, who I saw in a bleak common in Poland? lying on the road helpless, shivering, and hardly having wherewithal to cover his nakedness. I pitied the poor soul. Though I felt the severity of the air myself, I threw my mantle over him, and immediately I heard a voice from the heavens, blessing me for that piece of charity, saying, You will be rewarded, my son, for this in time. I went on, night and darkness overtook me. No village was to be seen. The country was covered with snow, and I was unacquainted with the road. Tired, I alighted and fastened my horse to something like a pointed stump of a tree, which appeared above the snow. For the sake of safety, I placed my pistols under my arm, and laid down on the snow, where I slept so soundly that I did not open my eyes till full daylight. It is not easy to conceive my astonishment to find myself in the midst of a village, lying in a churchyard, nor was my horse to be seen, but I heard him soon after neigh somewhere above me. On looking upwards, I beheld him hanging by his bridle to the weathercock of the steeple. Matters were now very plain to me. The village had been covered with snow overnight. A sudden change of weather had taken place. I had sunk down to the churchyard whilst asleep, 
gently and in the same proportion as the snow had melted away. And what in the dark I had taken to be a stirring above the snow, to which I had tied my horse, proved to have been the cross or weathercock of the steeple. Without long consideration, I took one of my pistols, shot the bridle in two, brought the horse, and proceeded on my journey. Here the baron seems to have forgot his feelings. He certainly could have ordered his horse a feed of corn after fasting so long. He carried me well, advancing into the interior parts of Russia. I found traveling on horseback rather unfashionable in winter, therefore I submitted, as I always do, to the custom of the country, took a single horse sledge, and drove briskly towards St. Petersburg. I do not exactly recollect whether it was in Eastland or Yugamandland, but I remember that in the midst of a dreary forest I spied a terrible wolf making after me, with all the speed of a ravenous winter hunger. He soon overtook me. There was no possibility of escape. Mechanically, I laid myself down flat in the sledge and let my horse run for our safety. What I wished, but hardly hoped or expected, happened immediately after. The wolf did not mind me in the least, but took a leap over me, and falling furiously on the horse, began instantly to tear and devour the hind part of the poor animal, which ran the faster for his pain and terror. Thus unnoticed and safe myself, I lifted my head slyly up, and with horror I beheld that the wolf had ate his way into the horse's body. It was not long before he had fairly forced himself into it, when I took my advantage, and fell upon him with the butt-end of my whip. This unexpected attack in his rear frightened him so much that he leaped forward with all his might. The horse's carcass dropped on the ground, but in his place the wolf was in the harness, and I on my part whipping him continually, we both arrived in full career safe at St. Petersburg, contrary to our respective expectations and very much to the astonishment of the spectators. I shall not tire you, gentlemen, with the politics, arts, sciences, and history of this magnificent metropolis of Russia, nor trouble you with the various intrigues and pleasant adventures I had in the politer circles of that country, where the lady of the house always receives the visitor with a dram and a salute. I shall confine myself rather to the greater and nobler objects of your attention, horses and dogs, my favorites in the brute creation, also to foxes, wolves, and bears, with which, and game in general, Russia abounds more than any other part of the world and to such sports, manly exercises, and feats of gallantry and activity, as show the gentleman better than musty Greek or Latin, or all the perfume, finery, and capers of French wits, or petit maîtres. 